There will probably be some more struggles, but we're going to crank it up. So, um, I'm John Melby from LA Poverty Department, and you know we're really uh, happy to have this exhibition here uh, about the Skid Row Neighborhood Council, the, um, and the, and the, and the, and the, you know, the uh, efforts to sabotage it. And um, uh, Adrian, Adrian Riskin, you know, has done a lot of the behind the, the, the excavation of what happened. Mm -hmm. And um, and General Trump was the leader of the campaign to uh, get us to skip on the council. So, there, so we're going to talk about, we're, initially we're going to talk about the, you know, what what happened, you know, what what, what was the undermining that, that, um, that happened. And then uh, and then we also want to talk about the, um, just, just how it, the, the effort to get it did bring the whole neighborhood together. So we want to cover a little bit about that. A lot of the people here were involved in that. And, uh, and then I also, because LA, LA Poverty Board was doing a project about public safety, community generated public safety as opposed to, you know, inflicted public safety. Right, right. And, um, and uh, so um, we also want to maybe get people's ideas, these guys, but also the audience about about how how the um, you know the Skid Row Neighborhood Council effort and had it also passed, how that would you know support um, real community safety and, 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 and how how courting it was really an effort to, to undermine also. So. Um, I'm going to turn it over to these guys, and um, I guess I want to thank uh, the California Humanities, which has been um, uh, made, it, made it possible to do this. So, um, I don't know, Adrian, maybe we can start with you and explain um, what, what, your, uh, what you want covered. Okay, well, thanks. That's all. Right. We were talking about this going over. Okay. Uh, so, hi, I'm Adrian Riskin, and uh, I run this blog, michaelcohouse.org, that's based on making Public Records Act requests, uh, mostly business improvement districts, but also other public agencies that I interface with them. And um, I, I first learned about this Skid Row Neighborhood Council effort because of the because of the connection with business improvement districts. Like business improvement districts were in, deeply involved from the very beginning, in fact, from the day after your election was certified. Uh, Blair Beston of the Historic Core and Estella Lopez of the Downtown Industrial District bid um, began lobbying the city against the SRNC. And uh, over the course of, of my requests, I got all kinds of fragmentary information, but um, sometimes I can't remember when it was. I forgot to check that one thing. Uh, sometime in the late summer of 2017, I got this huge load of emails from the downtown center bid, which is run by the Central City Association of Los Angeles. Carol Schatz started both of them. Well, she started the bid, like she ran the Central City Association for a long time. And uh, this, this set of emails was amazing. It just revealed like uh, the inner workings of the organized effort against the, the SRNC. Um, beginning on March 20th, uh, 2017, when Estella Lopez emailed about 40 people in the downtown uh, kind of power elite, um, announcing the formation of this this uh, limited liability corporation, United DTLA, that was formed to uh, basically hire lobbyists to lobby against the neighborhood council. And, um, so, I guess what I'm going to talk about is some aspects of, of those emails and the kind of discussions that these people had when they thought they were talking privately amongst themselves about uh, what the election, how to, how to subvert the election, and about what the success for the neighborhood council would mean to them. Um, it's kind of astounding. So, uh, like, there's a lot of emails involved in this and uh, a lot of detail. And so, I, I put them all on the internet. Uh, morning so you can get them on your phone you can get the like the notes and the emails I'll be talking about on your phone if you want to um, the I put them all on a website which is at f o u p u dot org um, so you'll see it's it's like today's date there's two things there one's a PDF uh, with 
like some of the emails that I'll be talking about, and the other is a zip archive with every possible one of the emails. I don't have time to talk about all of them at all, but if you want to look through them, they're just fascinating. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, yeah. I'm not going to read the list, but if you look at the, the March 20th one from Estella Lopez, where she announced the existence of like this uh, LLC and also this organized effort against the neighborhood council, the recipient list is amazing. Okay, it has lobbyists uh, like Michael Gagan, who's been involved in fighting neighborhood council since Kid Row since 2000. It turns out um, it has developers whose names I can't exactly remember, but they're all listed there. Uh, it has other bid. Directors like um, Blair Best and Rena Betty from the Fashion District did. Um, it has uh, people from the Central City Association, Jessica Law. Uh, amazingly, Carol Schatz was not on the list at the beginning, and she had to email Estelle Lopez. I have an email where she says, Hey, Estelle, put me on your list. And Estelle said, Okay. Um, it's, I love the, like, the interpersonal thing. <laughs> anyway, the list is there. Uh, and I have in, in that PDF you'll see there's like a couple pages that describe uh, each person. There's oh, there's a bunch of business owners from Skid Row who own like seafood wholesalers and fash, uh, fabric wholesalers. Um, they're all listed in there too. I suppose they own their buildings and stuff. Um, so uh, they they hired Rocky Del Cavio to to lobby for them and. Uh, He's a former city attorney of Los Angeles, but now he's a lawyer with, uh, I don't know who he's with anymore. He was with Minor LLP at the time, but they've evidently been sold to someone else, and I guess he went with them. Um, and, uh, but I think from reading these emails that Estella Lopez basically outlined the whole uh, campaign that they used against the neighborhood council. Like, uh, she, there's, there's one email in there from like the 21st of March, where she emailed Carol Schatz and said, here are the talking points I want us to use to fight the, the neighborhood council. Um, and if, if you see them, like she made these things up and then you can listen to uh, the recordings of people giving public comment at city council meetings. They're reading straight off of her list uh, of things. Like she says to say, like I'm a business owner, I live in, I own business or property in Skid Row. Um, I'm concerned about the process. Uh, one of a very large group of stakeholders who didn't know anything about this and it's gonna hurt everything that I live for, so please uh, don't do it. Um, it must be suspended until there's adequate information, et cetera. She, you can see the, the whole campaign that everybody got familiar with uh, there being born when she sends this email to Carol Schatz and says, hey, what do you think of these talking points? Carol Schatz says, oh, they're great. One thing about that email, if, if you read it, um, that made me a little proud is that uh, Estella Lopez said to Carol, Sorry, it took me so long to get this to you. I was tied up all day with CPRA requests. That's the public <laughs> oh, yeah. That was my, uh, my work. That was <laughs> I don't do it to take up her time, okay? But I can't. I'm not sorry that it does. <laughs> okay, and uh, one thing that I, I really learned from from those early emails is that uh, you know, nobody knew who was behind this this United DPLA thing, um, but but. Uh, Estella Lopez from the very beginning was soliciting donations. She said, we need donations, give me the checks, okay? So um, I'll talk a little at the end about what happened to those checks. I mean, the short version is I don't know, but I'll tell you the kinds of things I've done to try and discover. But uh, it later turned out that on papers that United DKLA filed, uh, the phone number of Estella Lopez's bid was given as the phone number of United so I think it was more than just her accepting checks. She was also taking phone messages for them. Um, as you, you read through the emails, you'll see the, the list of recipients starts to grow. It's like they're adding new people, uh, property owners from the fashion district. Like It's like this expanding circle of property owners who got more and more concerned about the problems that would um, be caused to them by, uh, by the state road council. Um, and uh, she, Estella Lopez, by a few days into the campaign, was telling her uh, her audience to like email Gracie Liu about um, all the flaws in the process and how they had to suspend everything immediately because it wasn't going to work, and if they weren't going to suspend it, they should at least have online voting. Um, uh, maybe you'll talk about the, the significance of that online voting stuff. Um, what, a, what a nightmare. Uh, 
Um, and she, uh, Estela Lopez was talking independently with Jose Guizar at that time, but she also tells all these people, um, don't forget, CC all your emails to, to Guizar's office um, so that he knows that we're concerned. Um, one thing I haven't done yet is check that list of email recipients against the uh, city's list of campaign com contributors. Um, I know some of them already, I know, give money to Guizar regularly, but uh, I'm sure that many of them um, okay, and then uh, another thing that I, I think is really interesting in the emails, it's not like, it's not super consequential, but the whiny tone that they have with each other, <laughs> it's just, it's astounding, you know? They, uh, they're like, everything's unfair. I tried to register after online voting was approved. I tried to register, but it didn't work. What should I do? Somebody emails Estella Lopez. She says, oh, well, email Gracie, email Jose Rizar, email everybody and complain. It's like, you know, they're sitting at a computer and some web page didn't load right, and they're emailing their city council member about it, okay? Um, and, uh, and, um, oh, right, and then another thing, this was a big deal in the appeal process, uh, I don't know, I hope you're all familiar with that, maybe you're, it's explained up here, but uh, um, the downtown Los Angeles Neighborhood Council had a lot of, a lot of members of the board were on this email list, um, six or seven of them, and uh, three days before the election on April 3rd, one of those members who has two pictures up here just because of this episode, um, somehow got a, a Excel spreadsheet that had the names and email addresses of a bunch of um, people who were already registered through D-Link to vote online in neighborhood council elections. He sent it out to this whole kind of covert mailing list and told them to use their connections to lobby these people and make sure that they voted um, against the neighborhood council, which is part of, I'm sure, why if you looked over here, the, uh, the vote tallies, the, the absolute just imbalance between paper ballots and online uh, ballots is astounding. Anyway, um, this guy, Jacob Douglas Van Horn, I always call him by his full name because he goes by it so ludicrous sounding, um, <laughs> emailed it out to, to his friends. And uh, you can get the actual spreadsheet, it's in that zip archive if you want to look at the 600 whatever names and email addresses that he uh, sent out to these people. I feel a little bad posting people's personal email addresses uh, on the internet like that, but he started it, so. Um, right. <laughs> um, okay, and then I guess the last thing I want to really talk about was, um, well, actually there's a couple more things. Um, there's this episode on April 4th about uh, concerning a pop-up poll in Little Tokyo. Uh, these pop-up polls are another um, it's like the law. The law says no pop-up polls. Right. 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 So, so they they introduced polls like all over uh, downtown at various times before the election. They had them in bid offices. The fashion district had one in their office. The Central City Asso Central City East Association had one in their office, and they had one in some apartment building in Little Tokyo on April fourth. And there's this amazing sequence of emails in that set about what happened. Um, so the uh, the vice president or somebody in the uh, on the staff of the Little Tokyo bid uh, wrote to the whole group about this. She said there was someone yelling at potential voters to vote yes. One woman said there was a line to register and she felt intimidated and left. And also there was a man yelling uh, to vote yes. And uh, then uh, Rena Letty said she's the director of the fashion district bid. In response, she said, "Did anyone take photos or video?" It's like. Um, that's, that was like the beginning of this feeling among these people that uh, somehow all the rules were being broken by the proponents and they had to do something about it. Um, this escalated the next day uh, to this to a kind of surreal level. Um, I guess you all had a rally on April 6th in San Julian Park, right? Okay, so on April, that was on April 6th, the day of the election, okay? So on April 5th, um, they, they were getting super paranoid and they cut their list down from about, it was about up to about 50 people by now. Um, they cut it down to just 12 people. Uh, the names are listed in the PDF there, uh, which is like this select group. And um, so, uh, what happened there? Oh yeah, so, um, so uh, Van Horn 
trying to, to set up some dirty tricks, ask the whole group, this, this little select group, he asked them, has anyone verified that the SRNC Formation Committee has the necessary permits for their rally with live entertainment in San Julian Park tomorrow? So, you know, you always hope your enemies have made some little slip up that you can get them in trouble with mom and dad for. And uh, so then Bob Newman answered him. Um, Bob Newman, I'm not sure what the guy does. Uh, people have tried to explain it to me before. He works for the Historic Corps. He's on d -Link. He has something to do with SRO Corporation, maybe? I don't know. No, formerly. He's formerly. He he used to. Used to. Okay, formerly. anyway, he's, he's like and everywhere. SRO What's that? Tudor Island Truck. Oh, okay. Tudor Island Truck. All right. He, he's like everywhere, and I'm not, I'm not surprised he's not here today. He usually comes to my talks. To, I'm not kidding. To watch me. Um, anyway, he answered and said, uh, I just come. He, he said to, to Van Horn, I just contacted Wendell and I contacted SRO. They both said they have the permits from Park and Recreation till 9 p.m. And then he uh, had another thought and emailed a few minutes later. Um, also, and of no surprise, both parties, these are his contacts, Wendell, <coughs> Blatson gave him and somebody at SRO. Uh, also, and of no surprise, both parties stated that they are bringing people in that do not live in downtown. Both sources agreed to pass this info to Dunn. Van Horn asked him, do these sources know where they are picking up people? And uh, Newman said, working on that now. One strong possible lead is Becky Denison from Venice Beach. And then he asked the whole list. I don't know if you know anything about LA County, Becky Denison is ridiculous, right? She's not chartering buses to bring voters from Venice to San Julian Park. Anyway, uh, so then he asked, who has some strong media contacts and see if they would come out tomorrow? More cameras. All right, um, and then the next day, the day of the election, most of the emails, if you look at them, are about uh, them tracking the tally of votes and stuff, but uh, there's still, they couldn't let this go about Sam Julian Park and the ongoing voter fraud. Um, so, uh, Bob Newman was at Sam Julian Park during the rally and he told the group, uh, I'm sure this is no surprise that they are registering people to vote before they will allow them to eat here at the rally in Sam Julian Park. Okay. And then uh, the last thing I just want to mention is, um, is Van Horn's response to that, which uh, contained a screenshot from, from some Facebook page, maybe, you know, the neighbor accounts to Facebook page, I'm not sure. But uh, he, said, he said about the, the screenshot, he said, see the attached screenshot, which is directing non-LA CAN members to go to LA CAN to get documents. Uh, and the, the quote that he's talking about was from Manuel Compito, who said, for all members of Friends of Gladys Park, this is the pro uh, person and that was characterized by Van Horn as indicating voter fraud. He said, for all members of Friends of Gladys Park, Skid Row 3 on 3 Street Ball League and Children's Program in Skid Row, DTLA, if you have any problems or questions with voting for SRNC, go to LA CAN. We are definitely collaborating and partnership with them and they have whatever you need to make certain you can vote. Didn't show up. How did that voter fraud? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they, were, they didn't show up. Right. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot. The last thing, I just want to mention how I have not been able to find out how the money worked. So here's what happened. Um, I, I, when I make requests of business improvement districts, I often ask them for uh, like copies of their ledgers and their transactions. This is like a standard public record thing, you know, like what they spend their money on. It. It's obviously public and they never argue with me. So I asked Estelle Lopez in March of 2017 for, um, for a copy of all their transactions. And uh, she fought me and fought me and fought me. And I had to get a lawyer to write her a letter saying, like, be serious, okay? And so then uh, she agreed to give them to me. And I finally got a copy of their transactions. And I got them uh, like in October 2017, okay? And um, it was this Excel spreadsheet that was so heavily edited and so weird that I couldn't even sort it by date. Um, it was uh, just basically destroyed as something useful. Uh, and that was, I, oh, the, uh, the metadata from the spreadsheet showed that she had edited it. Um, there's a picture of the metadata in the PDF before she sent it to me. So I have a feeling that it didn't, she didn't give it to me straight out of the accounting software, like most of the bids do. Um, but there were some huge payments in there right around uh, the time that they were hiring uh, lobbyists, um, and both of them were, were to employee 
that's what it said. One was for uh, $5,992 and one was for $15,403, which is like on the order of magnitude that the payments to the lobbyists would have been. It ended up that they totaled 45,000 by the end, but uh, anyway, I, I'm not sure what those mean, but they strike me as super suspicious. So after I got that and I couldn't tell from that, what had happened, I asked her for copies of all their bank statements from 2017, um, because you can't edit bank statements. And um, she refused to give them to me and said I couldn't have them because they just duplicated the information in the spreadsheet. Um, and uh, that's where the story ends. Okay, I'm having a lawyer write to her about that also, but these things take forever. So eventually, I imagine, I'll find out what happened with this money, but it's not gonna be anytime soon. Um, so that's uh, the story of like the new stuff that I discovered since the last time I talked about it. Most of these pictures are based on those emails, not all of them. But um, should I take a question? Do you want to talk and take questions on the end? Okay, well, um, any, uh, any questions about about what Adrian's been talking about? Yes, I'm John. So if you had to summarize your, I mean, because I, I feel as though you have this unique uh, take on all of these different personalities and minds in these, uh, in these countries. If you had to like summarize your best understanding of what their opposition is, like what what frightens frighten them about the neighborhood council? What like if you had to just distill it into like some key points, what were they afraid of? And why did they fight it? I think they're, well, okay, I'm sorry, I got to distill it into two, two things. Um, I think that they're afraid of disenfranchised people having any power, okay? They, uh, business improvement districts are like this hyper-efficient way for, for property owners and, <coughs> and other quite rich people to, to funnel their power, uh, into funnel their desires into the city um, and, and get reactions, okay? So, so they have this, uh, this superficial setup with the city to like, share their needs and the city reacts to them, okay? And part of that is neighborhood councils. You know, D-Bank functions as this way for developers to legitimize, almost launder their kind of desires uh, so that the city can act on them. Um, as if they, they were, because they're approved by this kind of popular thing instead of just the developer saying, hey, we want a 20 story building here. The neighborhood council says, yeah, we all want a 20 story building here. We live here. So, um, so a Skid Row neighborhood council would interfere with that process uh, severely, okay? Like, naturally, nobody knows for sure what the Skid Row neighborhood council is gonna, gonna feel about any given building project, but I think probably it's not gonna be the same as D-Link at large. So number one is a dilution of their power because neighborhood councils have this charter. The charter gives them like a voice with the city. And not that the city was, I'm sorry, this is not distilling anything, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, not that the city's gonna to listen to the neighborhood council, the Skid Row neighborhood council, but it's gonna make everything look a little less legitimate, I think. So, all right, now that I've talked my way through it, I think, they're worried about diluting their power and diluting this facade of legitimacy that d gives them um, as far as development and, and like the transfer of power downtown. How's that? Yeah, great. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you <laughs> diluted it. Yeah. I mean, like, it would have taken a few days to really get the sense of it, so even in a few minutes, that's great. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Any other Adrian specific questions? Or? Oh, here's Tom. What motivate what you're doing? I don't think anybody else, maybe in the world, is doing it, let alone Los Angeles. What motivated you initially to go so deep into these? What Skid Row? Well, just, you know, bids and public record acts, and just, you go so deep into this stuff. Well, okay. So, I mean, what motivated me at the very beginning was I used to live in Hollywood. And I saw some bid security guards harassing a homeless man who was obviously not in his right mind. And then 
they made a false police report to the LAPD and it made me so angry. I didn't actually know who they were, but they, you know, the, the guy was muttering, they took some of his stuff and the guy was muttering to himself that he was gonna kill them, but it wasn't scary because he was not sane, you know? And uh, they called the LAPD and reported him for making criminal threats, which that's not. If you stand there muttering, I'm gonna kill you, I'm gonna kill you. It's not a threat, okay, it's not any kind of threat. So, I didn't know who they were, but I had I filmed them and had a picture of their t-shirts, so I tracked down the bid that they worked for and tried to complain about them. And the director of security would not take my complaint. He wouldn't even tell me their names so I could report them to the state. Uh, so that made me mad. I didn't know what business improvement districts were, so I read up on it a little and went to one of their meetings and found out that I could make public records act requests of them. And so I decided to make a few to try, just to try to educate myself about what they were. But what I uncovered was this nest of like privilege and like covert dealings with the city and things like that struck me as so unfair beyond this one incident. Like uh, I found out that another bid in Hollywood was arresting like physical, making physical custodial arrests of more than uh, a thousand people a year, uh, right there in the middle of Hollywood, and like handcuffing them and transporting them in their cars. It just, okay, the whole thing struck me as so unfair, like, it still makes me sick, okay? So then I decided that I was gonna learn everything I could about them in order to dismantle all of them. And uh, <laughs> I don't think that, I, I think that I may be able to do it, actually. So that's the short version. <laughs> so, so Eric, any question, um, Adrian? Um, you know, considering the actions that, that were taken by, by the, those who opposed the, the SRNC, you know, um, it doesn't seem that there's really an illegality involved in it, so much as it was that they were able to leverage this online voting for, for, their, for, their, for, their, you know, for their side. Um, and the Skid Row Neighborhood Council Formation Committee was not able in, to have enough time to leverage our resources towards that um, because of, it was instituted at such a last minute. Um, you know, so is, is there any chance of proving any illegality, illegality rather, in, in, the, in the efforts made by the lobbyists or by any of the bids in, in their opposition of this? Um, is, is there any chance of proving that or finding any evidence of that? Uh, or should we just focus on, you know, perhaps a year from now when there be, might be an opportunity for the Skid Row Neighborhood Council to, to reapply? Okay, well, I'm not a lawyer. My feeling is that the blatant illegality happened because of, on the part of the city. I think what the city did, approving online voting at the last minute um, in this super shady way, I think probably you guys are gonna be able to prove that's illegal, I don't know. What the, what the lobbyists and the bids did is a little more, it's a little, um, it's less definite, okay? But I think there are some, well, first of all, I know that they, the lobbyists violated some of the city's lobbying laws by not reporting their actions on time. So what they did wasn't so much illegal as the fact that they didn't report it on time. And I have turned them into the, the Ethics Commission for those kind of violations. Um, although the Ethics Commission takes forever to do anything and they won't tell anybody if they're doing anything or not. So who knows what's happening with that. But. Um, there are also laws that control what business improvement districts are allowed to spend their money on. They're super limited. They're about, they can only spend it on things that they announce in advance uh, in these various plans they have to file. And they can only spend it on things that, that affect their specific district in a way that's different from how they affect people outside the district. These are called, it's super strange. They can spend their money on what are called special benefits for their district. They're not allowed to spend money on general benefits which happen to help their district because they help everybody, okay? Yeah. Sorry, it's unclear. So, yeah. like for instance, they could spend their money on uh, putting new benches in their district, okay? But they, they probably can't lobby for a law that says there have to be benches all over the city because then everybody gets benches. So they're, they're spending their particular money on something that's gonna help everybody, even if it also helps their people, it doesn't help them specially. So that's that's part of the restriction. So my feeling is when they lobby against the Skid Row Neighborhood Council, assuming that have not having it is a benefit for them, okay, from their point of view, they think it is, okay. Uh, it's not a special benefit because it helps all the other bids too. They already admitted this because there's more than one involved, you know. So I think they probably broke the law there too. But like, who's gonna 
hold them to account for that. Nobody is. So, as far as whether they should just wait until the next time, it's up to the organizers. So, um, so, oh, here's a, yeah. I can't read the name, so I don't know. Um, if you publish all of this somewhere else than here in the exhibition, or who knows about it? Like, the broader public, how does the broader public know about it? Um, well, I publish, uh, the, the stuff about the emails I publish on my blog, um, and these pictures, too. And then this stuff, General Jeff put together, and uh, I don't know if it's published, uh, and Catherine. It's also available, is it? Or? Um, we have some of the things on our, our website, skidrowneighborhoodcouncil.com, but a lot of the things that we didn't uh, release publicly because it's uh, potentially evidence in our pending lawsuit. So we didn't want to, we don't want to try our case in, 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 the, in the public until it uh, goes before the judge. So um, we don't actually have a house online to, to, to release all this stuff yet, so. So, so General Jeff, let's move over to <laughs> you. That's a good way to do it. Um, one, one thing, first of all, I just want to say that's completely mystified me in the, in the, in the discussion is, is when you hear, as Adrian was quoting them and saying, we didn't know about it. And I find this is really, you know, really bizarre since I know that, that, that uh, the Skid Row Neighborhood Council Formation Committee you know, was has, has was active in a making it possible to even sub, get subdivisions possible, and talked uh, for years not only in, in Skid Row but reached out to all the other neighboring councils in the city and stuff like that. So it's it's completely uh, in, it's not credible to say that they didn't know about anything. But that aside, how did how, when did you when and as you were moving the 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 city's procedures forward in, 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 you know, in filing, et cetera, every step of the way, when did you s suddenly notice that things were, um, that were happening that shouldn't be happening, and how did you, uh, tell us that story. Woo, thank you. First, first, before I get to that, let me just thank uh, everybody for coming. I want to thank Los Angeles Poverty Department for, uh, you know, having this, this, this exhibit. Obviously, it's near and dear to my heart. My name is General Jeff. Uh, 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 born and raised is Jeff Page. Uh, I have the nickname of General Jeff since high school. Um, and, and I've cared very deeply about the city of Los Angeles. Uh, obviously, they don't need my help in Beverly Hills, so I felt like they need me in Skid Row, so I reduced myself to a state of homelessness. And uh, in August of 2006, and I've been there for 11 and a half years as a community activist. Uh, there's a whole alphabet worth of needs, you know, just pick a letter and, and do something. And one of the things that uh, in 2007, I met uh, OG, we know him as OG, Manuel Capito. Uh, Adrian mentioned him uh, in some of his emails during his presentation. Um, and when I, in 2007, OG, you know, started this uh, basketball league, the Skid Row 33 Street Ball League, and he asked me to help him run it. And so, Every day we were practically just, uh, not practically, but every day we would just uh, brainstorm constantly about you know what was wrong with the community, what had been wrong, what improvements there were, what uh, you know what needs to be addressed, and, and how best to address them. And almost immediately, uh, OG kept talking about the downtown Los Angeles neighborhood counts. I don't even know what that. What D link? What is D link? What is this D link thing you're talking about? And he got to explain to me about what it was. Uh, I wasn't into politics, so you know I didn't even have an email before I met OG. And so I, I, you know, I got an email. And as much as I send out emails now, people are like, oh my God, he's a master communicator. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't even have this lyric 10 years ago. And so anyway, um, Charles Porter is someone that's been in our community almost uh, 20 years. And so he knows the history of Skid Row's uh, efforts to create a neighborhood council before I got there. And so it's very important to note that. And some of that is mentioned on the wall, the 1999 city charter, um, you know, we the people of the city of Los Angeles voted in the city charter that uh, the neighborhood council system would come online across the city to be a liaison between the government and the people. Um, because there, apparently there are a lot of people that complain that there was a disconnect uh, from them and their so-called representatives in City Hall. 
And so the neighborhood council system will be more of a, a middleman, a go-between, if you will, to help them better address their issues with more of a grassroots community feel. Um, so as that happened, um, all across the city, they were, um, so we have another community event, and his brother Lee is uh, gonna go support, he's supporting here, now he's supporting over there, there's a lot going on. Um, and, um, you know, it's a critical time. I know, you know, just for, for the sake of documentation, I know a lot of people the March for Our Lives, you know, big march, national march, a lot of folks were out there, and so a lot of energy in the world. Um, but yeah, and so um, Charles Porter, so across the city, um, excuse me, and they were uh, basically carving up land about what, how, what areas would belong to what neighborhood council. Um, in downtown Los Angeles, there was a big, huge debate. Of, you know, it's supposed to be all of downtown Los Angeles. Um, there were some people in like the Arts District, Little Tokyo, that did, that felt like they would be left behind, so they wanted to, you know, create a separate neighborhood council. And because Skid Row uh, brushes up immediately next door to both Arts District and Little Tokyo, you know, there there were talks that uh, Skid Row should, you know, possibly, you know, join with those folks, and then they wound up. Uh, Arts District Little Tokyo wind up connecting with uh, Chinatown and uh, a couple other communities and creating the Historic Cultural Neighborhood Council because they didn't want to be drowned out by uh, the Outtown Center's Neighborhood Council known as D-Lane. And so Skid Row, so there's this big huge fight. So that's what's going on as you see the, the numbers, number two, that's what it's talking about. So there was a huge, in the exhibit, uh, there was a huge battle and uh, basically came before the, uh, so the structure is, the, the neighborhood council systems are underneath an organization, a city department called the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. Above them immediately is the Board of Neighborhood Commissioners. And so it is the Board of Neighborhood Commissioners who oversee Dunn's activity, Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. And so while Dunn oversee, immediately oversees the neighborhood councils, when this uh, situation was going on, um, it basically had to go before Bonk, and if Bonk signed off on it, Skid Row could have had its own neighborhood council back in 2000. And so, as Adrian spoke to it, uh, there was D-Link board member, uh, Michael Gagan, uh, and others, but he led the, uh, the uh, application for the, the downtown Sense neighborhood council and basically put up a fight and said, you know, if we don't have Skid Row, uh, you know, then, you know, we're not, we're going to withdraw application. A lot of the Skid Row at that time didn't have the grassroots uh, leadership from the community, and it was more of the nonprofits, the missions, and social service providers that were representing our community. And you know, their whole thing is they felt like, oh, we need to be included, you know, and connected to the downtown business sector. And I'm thinking they were thinking of their personal. Me personally, uh, you know, I think that they were just thinking about their, uh, you know, personal things as organizations where they can be connected to these big, huge corporations and, and set up a, a pipeline so they get the tax donations and things of that sort. So that's why they wanted to see the table with the big boys. Um, but you know, we can't prove that neither, that's neither here nor there now. Uh, we can't prove that. But so anyway, there's a lot of wonderful, wonderful documentation. And going back to 2007, 2008, 2009, uh, you know, OG would always bring this, you know, talk, every time he had a complaint with D-Link, he was like, we need our own neighborhood council. And my whole thing is, OG, we're not ready yet. OG, we're not ready yet. And so um, the, the basketball league, OG said, you know, there's this uh, education committee. They have a bunch of committees underneath the neighborhood, within the neighborhood council. And he said, there's opportunity for us to get some funding, but they don't know how to get us funding. And he couldn't figure it out. So I wound up becoming the league's marketing director. And through the education, what we did was we added an educational component to our basketball league. We had the words of the week that, you know, teamwork, athletic, you know, uh, strategies that were more athletic words of the week. And so we'd get each, each before each week of games, uh, you know, we'd speak on that. and. Um, you know, had the definition, and, and Charles Porter added, added some African proverbs and things of that sort. And then uh, we wanted to qualify for funding from D-Link, and so that's where I first learned about D-Link. And through our efforts from there, people encouraged me to actually run for the D-Link board down for some So I represented on D-Link, representing Skid Row residents from 2008 to 2014. So that's where I was able to get the understanding of, of what the neighborhood council system really was. But, um, and then as you see on, on, on the exhibit portion number three, uh, there in, in uh, June of 2014, again, uh, Manuel Compito, known as OG, he was really livid with D-Link 
And he said, forget it, that's it. We don't need you anymore. We're, we're gonna, you know, the, the time is now. We've been putting this off for far too long. We're gonna start our own neighborhood council. And he said that on, he actually released it online. And so I, you know, had his back. Yeah, yeah, whatever, yeah, what he said is time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then I, you know, after the, after we went online and, you know, I talked to OG and he explained to me what was going on. I said, okay, great. Well, when are you gonna, you know, when are you gonna start, whatever you start this movement, I, you know, I'm there to support you and let me know. He said, oh no, I'm not gonna start anything. And I'm thinking, but you just went online and blasted to the world. This is the time is now when it starts to with council. And I lended my voice to the, you know, to that effort. So it's like, you gotta do it. <laughs> our, name, our name's a reputation online. He said, oh no, 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 I'm too busy. I'm about to retire. I'm, I'm, I'm done with activism. You do it. And I'm thinking, I, what, are you, what have I got myself into? And then finally it's like, well, we put it out there. We got to do it. And at the time, I still felt we don't have enough uh, leadership in our community to actually make this thing happen. But it's like, well, let's go for it. So then through doing the necessary research, come to find out, um, the since because we were already a part of a neighborhood council, we would have to subdivide and break away from the existing neighborhood council that we were connected to. And, but the problem was in the, the city charter, they created a subdivision ordinance. The ordinance is on the wall as exhibit number four and exhibit is underneath that. And so um, the problem with that is they had a subdivision, they spoke to it, but they didn't have the specific process of what it looked like. And so uh, that process needed to be uh, created and signed off on by the city and so um, through that, I found out at one of the city hall meetings that there was a, a community in Northeast uh, Los Angeles called Herman. And um, they're also in city, uh, council district 14, same as Skid Row. And so they urged uh, the, their council member uh, to actually create the subdivision ordinance to complete that process. And so the thing was, you know, just go back quickly. Um, at, at the 99 city charter, a wild subdivision is to, you know, for, for community to break away from uh, the current neighborhood councils because they were still trying to get all the neighborhood councils up and running. They said, well, we'll, we'll come back to that process because there's no need to talk about breaking away. We're trying to put them together. So for those that don't know, currently there are 97 neighborhood councils throughout the entire city of Los Angeles. Um, there were 96 at this time, but Herman, the community I'm speaking about now, um, they had an election two days after ours last year and they, they, they got approved. So going back to 2014, uh, I, I, I uh, connected with Herman's uh, formation committee and their leadership. We had a one-on-one -on -one meeting in uh, Hollywood and we sat down and talked. And so we realized that we should come together uh, uh, and uh, become allies to communities of allies to push this subdivision process through in City Hall. And you know there was an exhibit I forwarded to John, but it's not up on the wall. But um, I, we wound up getting the uh, subdivision approved. Uh, that was in November of October of 2015 when the uh, city council signed off on it, and uh, they wound up getting implemented until September of 2016. And then um, uh, they opened up the uh, uh, subdivision ap application process in October of 2016, and the deadline was December 19th of uh, 2016, and then that's when we were able to uh, apply and offer our uh, subdivision application. But uh, going back to getting the subdivision application uh, approved, that was the first win for Skid Row. Um, the fact that we came together um, as a community, the fact that we you know, went to uh, City Hall and actually pushed to urge them to make this happen, because before, um, uh, before we added our name to the subdivision uh, battle, uh, that issue was dead in City Hall, and that wasn't uh, the folks in Herman had told me that that item had been uh, tabled in City Council for about a year and a half. Uh, so, uh, like all of 2012, 2013, 2014, and half of 2014. So, um, the fact that Skid Row's name has uh, uh, our community has a bigger, louder name more prominent name than Herman, that's why we were able to get it back on the calendar. And so um, at a bunk meeting in 2015, when the uh, subdivision process was approved, uh, initially approved by city council, uh, the general manager, Gracie Lou Dunn, uh, publicly said during the meeting that, you know, she 
personally acknowledge that City of Skid Row, and, uh, we had a, played a prominent role in getting the subdivision uh, after, uh, subdivision process approved. So moving forward, we had tons of community meetings, um, you know, did a lot of research in terms of what the process was, and it was, it, it was so limited. You know, 200 signatures, um, and, and a lot of people don't know the requirements, um, and it, it involved all stakeholders in the community. So, you know, residents, business owners, property owners, you know, in our community, the, the nonprofit organizations, like if you live, work, own property, if you have any, or just a, a, a like a, also an at-large, just a, a community interest stakeholder in Skid Row, you could have a, a play a role in the uh, creation of the Skid Row Neighborhood Council. And so, you know, there's a lot of misinformation that went out for a while that, you know, Skid Row Neighborhood Council is gonna be a resident only board. The city, the, the city doesn't allow that. It's 100%, that would never happen. And so a lot of the naysayer, that negative energy that went out against us is, oh, it's just the residents want to, you know, people envision this Skid Row Neighborhood Council just being like a, a, a board full of homeless residents just throwing the, 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 uh, a monkey wrench into the whole system of, of, of a democratic process for the city of Los Angeles. That would never happen. And I'm the type of person, I wouldn't even put my name to be a part of that kind of a process. So it's about including our, all stakeholders, all members of our community into the process so that we can address the issues. And so, you know, while the downtown standards neighborhood council, you know, and while we complain, it's difficult for Skid Row to get our agendas and our issues on the agenda uh, for uh, D-Link, for the downtown standards neighborhood council, because they're focused on, you know, the bars, the restaurants, the skyscrapers, development, down to revitalization, hotels, conventions, I mean, there, there's a lot of wonderful progress being made. That's great, but Skid Row's issues should not be put on the back burner for anyone. And so I was going through that while I was on the D-Link board from 2008 to 2014. So it just so happened um, in 2014 when I brought away, as you know, OG said it was time to start the Skid Row Neighborhood Council. It's like, oh, well, you know, we've got the wonderful momentum right now because um, you know, we definitely need to get our issues addressed. And so through this process, you know, we, you know, we, we, were, we already knew had done the research. So that's why even as the bids try to come up and, you know, talk online voting and do all the, you know, we had done things uh, so meticulously because we know for one, we're scared roles, so we know we're going to be scrutinized. You know, oh, we want to see their application. How do we, oh, their voter for the signature is going to be in that. So we want to make sure we dot our I's and cross T's. You know, a lot of people, a lot of different rumors that went around when it comes to the signatures, the petition signatures. So we heard about the process in advance because every day we're going to the city hall, and what's the latest, what's the process, what do we need to do? And so while, had, while the subdivision process had just freshly been approved, they hadn't vetted, they hadn't completed um, what the, uh, the requirements would be on the subdivision application. So we're checking, check. as, as, as soon as they got it, they, they let us know. So okay, we're gonna require a petition of 200 signatures. So bang, let's go out and get our 200 signatures. We went and got 200 signatures and we're ready to go. They said, no, 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 there has to be a, a specific form, you know, format. It has to be, you know, it has to say on there uh, specific information about, you know, what this is about, what the petition is for, uh, we, what if this uh, subdivision process, it also specifically has to say you're breaking away from the downtown Sense neighborhood council to start the Skid Row neighborhood council. It has to say that so that the, each signer, you know, can have the opportunity to have the wherewithal to know what, what they're actually signing. <sighs> so we had to go outside, you know, so those, that, those petitions are dead, then we had to go out and get some new, new uh, 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 signatures. And then that one was incomplete, so we, had, we actually took three rounds to actually get the signatures right. And at the end, we wound up uh, completing over 547, whatever the number was, more than 540 signatures. Um, while we only needed 200, but the thing was, you know, people from Skid Row, this is an important process. This is history in the making, and we didn't want to throw the dead uh, signatures out. So because it was part of this process, because it's about uplifting the people, giving out hope to our fellow community members, we added that into our package. So when we submitted that, we knew there were dead signatures in there, but then when, when the bids and, and Rocky Del Vio, the former city attorney, oh, look at all these dead signatures. Oh, look, they're trying to forge signatures. Look at this voter for, look at all of them. And it's like, all you have to do is ask us. We knew what that was. We just went, but here's the clean signatures here. We've got over 300 clean. You know, we only needed 200. 
It's like, oh, you needed 20,000 clean signatures. We didn't need 20,000. You, you, they're fanning the flames and they're making it seem like there's no, you know, we're skid rope. We already know we're going to be under, you know, serious uh, uh, scrutiny. We're, we're, we're not going to, you know, cheat the game just to try to hope to try to get a skid rope neighborhood council. That would defeat the whole purpose. You know, we got eyes, I've got eyes across the with the with the best of them. And so, you know, we knew in advance, even on election day, we knew that, uh, you know, the James Wood Community Center in Skid Row, uh, the, uh, the subdivision ordinance said there was only going to be one physical voting place. Great. Uh, that means if you're against us, you're going to have to bring your butt to Skid Row to, to defeat us. And so we, we weren't concerned with that. So then 13 days before the election, all of a sudden online voting gets pushed through. Wait, what? And so state law says that, uh, Online voting is, 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 is not allowed in elections. But then the city's argument, and we found this out after the election, was that um, they said neighborhood councils are not subjected to state law. And so that's why we're in the process now, as I fast forward a little bit, we're in the process of suing the city. Um, and so, because we're going to have to argue that in court because there's taxpayer funding involved <laughs> that goes to the city, and the city every year spends over three to four million dollars that spreads out throughout all the neighborhood councils across the city. And you're telling me that, that, that these elections are, are also, but all neighborhood council elections are overseen by the city clerk's office, which is, <laughs> how is it not subjected to state law? Those elections, whether it's the mayor's office, whether it's the city council, any other elections, are the neighborhood council elections not also subjected to the same state laws as the, the normal general elections of the city? And so I'll get you in a moment, Mr. Garcia. And so, um, you know, so there's, and there's a lot of other, a lot of other uh, details that have come out even, at, you know, so uh, on the voting day, I, we knew that there was gonna be, you know, they're gonna, they're looking for every little thing. They're gonna, you know, find, you know, tooth and comb to try to find the flaw in our application. Uh, we threw it out there online. We submitted it. You know, we found it's going to be public record. Simple. Um, you know, so we snatched a whole lot of uh, articles. In fact, because it, it technically could have been like maybe a 20 page or 30 page application. I think by the time I got done, we had some support letters from uh, neighborhood councils from across the city. I, you know, we wanted to go through all, you know, to all of them. But you know, it's hard getting the skid row delegation together and traveling, a lot of the meetings are at night across the city, it was a lot. So we stopped it somewhere between you know, 25, 30, I lost the count, but we had support from different city, uh, numerous city councils, from Silver Lake Neighborhood Council, Echo Park, Central Alameda, uh, 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 Watts Neighborhood Council, uh, Mid City, you know, there's Slank, the South Los Angeles Alliance of Neighborhood Councils have a bunch of, uh, neighborhood council, you know, so we had just wonderful support. Uh, Zapata King was uh, one of the uh, uh, the more newer, uh, the, the 96th neighborhood council we got, so we got a lot of wonderful support. And there were other neighborhood councils that were saying, hey, come, come before us, and I'm sure we'll give you a lot of support. And after that while, I was like, okay, that's, okay, we got a fat package. But when we got done, I think our, our application was maybe, it was over 180 pages. You know, we could have said, no, we, we want more than, we wanted to overwhelm more than enough to remove any and all doubt. If anybody has no idea what's going on, they can read through the, and we have, a, I believe it's in it's one of those binders on one of the back tables over there. Our application is in there and it sure. should be everything. Right, thanks John. And so it was like, you know, we're as transparent as possible. You know, we, we wanted to set up uh, community forums like t town hall style meetings where we put delegations together and just go to different, you know, uh, communities, areas in downtown, whoever had something to do with our, had to be involved in our subdivision vote, whether it's a, a big group or a small group, and just let them know why we want to create the Skid Row Neighborhood Council. And so it's important that while we talk about this, this, this talk today is a part of a series uh, uh, through Los Angeles Poverty Department focused on public safety. And I definitely want to uh, 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 put an emphasis on the fact that that was a key point of us wanting to create a Skid Row Neighborhood Council. Public, I mean, public safety, there's a lot of trash, simple life, quality of life issues. You know, there's a lot of trash all over Skid Row. Why is there so much trash in Skid Row? You know, we got a lot of people come feed the home. You know, it's not enough trash cans. You know, the, the irregular cleanups by the city. I mean, so there's a lot, there's simple coordination that needs to happen. Okay, well, with the Skid Row Neighborhood Council, we can actually, you know, contact the city. You know, have to have not just one voice. You know, okay, my voice is established as a Skid Row community activist, but the Skid Row Neighborhood Council would, would establish multiple voices, 10, 20 other voices on, on, on the board. 
and then now they now we have more voices in the community that can actually speak to some issues and get them addressed. I'm all for because I don't know how long I'm going to be here doing this, but only we need a skip on maybe council. Um, you know, another thing is that you know with Los Angeles. Uh, uh, police department, the way they police in Skid Row, uh, while a lot of people outside of our community don't really understand, you know, everything that was going on, but you know, it's, it's, it's inhumane to create, to uh, you know, falsify uh, reasons um, to put handcuffs on somebody that's sleeping on the sidewalk and then just, you know, take all their belongings just because, oh, it oh it looks ugly or looks nasty and oh they shouldn't be sleeping on the sidewalk. You're absolutely right. They shouldn't be sleeping on the sidewalk. But rather than criminalize these folks. Why don't you build them some housing? <laughs> Let, you know, so we Skid Row Neighborhood Council can, you know, also be like voices for you know, of, of the people of the community to uh, speak to to urge City Hall to say, hey, just like now, 1.2 billion dollars in HHH funding. Skid Row Neighborhood Council needs to have a voice in the community that can speak to this. The problem is downtown Santa Neighborhood Council. They can't speak to homelessness with a legitimate voice. They can offer some documents, but it's not gonna resonate. The Skid Row Neighborhood Council would have the legitimacy to actually speak to homelessness, and we could have nipped some, a whole lot of things in the butt. With HHH, they have an oversight committee that's uh, over, supposedly overseeing the uh, $1.2 billion, and all of a sudden, you know, everything is that whole measure HHH is behind the eight ball because a lot of them don't know what they're doing. You know, when you look at the, whether it's the mayor or whether it's the city council, our elected officials, they didn't run on the campaign of you know ending homelessness. They didn't even talk about it. And so when it comes to now, you know, homelessness is an issue citywide. What are you What are you going to do, Mr. Mayor? And he doesn't have it, so he defers to the nonprofits. The nonprofits don't know because they're only focused on what's going on inside their four walls. They don't know what happens because they, if they can't, especially in Skid Row, if they can't address the issues in, in, in the community, then how are they gonna help at lend a voice to the homeless issues across the city? So the Skid Row Neighborhood Council could potentially have a lot, you know, a combination of activists, nonprofits, business leaders, you know, and, and, and experts that, that really can collectively put forth uh, uh, policies and initiatives that could actually help influence the conversations that are going on and the decisions that are being made in city hall you know it, uh, uh, not only across the, the city but across the county and so there's you know there are numerous reasons why the skid row neighborhood council needs to be created a lot of people look at it oh it's just only about skid row no this is about homelessness which is citywide and so there's a lot you know we can even create like as, as i said initiatives that not only can in, be local but end up on state ballots federal issues. I mean, homelessness is a, is a federal issue, a nationwide issue, and, you know, there's a lot that needs to be done. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm <laughs> getting a little emotional here because, you know, the fact that um, we didn't get the Skid Row Neighborhood Council, and so as soon as we don't get the Skid Row Neighborhood Council, then all of a sudden homelessness just explodes. And there, it's, it's, not a, uh, it's not a coincidence. You know, we, we had our finger on the on, on the pulse of homelessness. We, the timing was right as soon as, you know, April 6th last year. You know, we're coming up on an annual uh, one year anniversary. Um, when we look, and, and then the fact that, you know, it's, it's, it was so emotional for our community because why is there so much opposition? You know, on one hand they say, oh, skate rolls nothing but, you know, drunks, bums, and addicts. And uh, you guys need to get up off your lazy bums and, uh, and, and go do something productive. Okay, we'll do something productive. We'll start a scare on neighborhood council. No, no, no. You, you're in the way of what we're trying to you go. Go away. And, okay, well, well, which is it? What, what do you, what do you, and then the whole thing is we're tired of listening to all this rigmarole. And, you know, it, it's not making sense. We're going to do what's in the best interest of our community where we live because there's nowhere else in this city or across this country where any decisions are being made for a community and the residents don't have a seat at the table. And you, in most, most communities, the residents have the loudest voice. It just so happens in Skid Row, we the people that live in Skid Row, we don't, our voice doesn't matter. And so it's like, well, with the, uh, 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 the uh, certification of a Skid Row Neighbor Council, we will be fully respected by the city of Los Angeles. There will be resources allocated right now, uh, neighborhood councils get $45,000 annually. So there's, you know, seed money to, you know, get some brooms and trash bags, 
you know, get, I mean, this stuff, you know, to just get up seven and, and get started. And so, plus the, uh, the hope that it would give uh, our community the fact that this is a resident-led movement. You know, we started, you know, for the people, of the people, and by the people. The very same principles that this country was founded on, that's all, that's all of it. It's part of the process. We're not trying to go against the grain and stop development. We don't want a dirty, nasty, filthy community. We want bright and shiny new stuff too. Why can't we have, why is all the new stuff way over there? What about our community? And we're you being left behind. And so people are, you know, I, you know, there's a lot of misnomers, a lot, you know, and like Adrian mentioned about, you know, who's trying to control the community. You know, the developers want to control it. They don't really know. So the bids are trying to control it. The downtown business sector, uh, there's, a, there's enough room for everybody, but they're missing the, the voice of the people. And that's what's going on with in Skid Row. I mean, if there's going to be, you know, alcohol in bars and, and, and restaurants, they want to penetrate in Skid Row. You can't just go come in our community and think you're just going to just do it and go willy nilly and do whatever you want to do on every other corner. We're going to this and that outdoor scene. You yeah, know that that is dangerous. Micro loss. So yeah, we're fighting an, an, an irresponsible projects that are coming into our community because it doesn't make sense. If you don't know what's going on in Skid Row, I don't care how much money you have, you're not going to come in and just blaze trails however you want to without hearing from the community. There's, you're not going to do that. That's what NIMBYism is. When everybody's saying, oh, we want to spread, you know, decentralize Skid Row and we'll spread it out across the city, where well, you're basically telling other communities where other people live, where their families and kids are, saying, hey, this we're, we're outsiders. We're just going to come into your community and this is what we're going to do. What are those residents going to say? Oh, no, no, the hell you're not. You know, so that's the so when we say that, oh, it's a problem. Oh, Skid Row. Oh, they don't need a neighborhood council. And it's like, but still, we have quality of life crimes. Uh, issues that that need to be addressed. Jeff, where 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 is the um, someone referenced the lawsuit? Where where is it? Maybe Adrian. Where 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 is it? Um, what's the fight for Skid Row neighborhood comes? Where is it at now? Uh, it's ongoing. And so, uh, just to get back, thank you, John, to get to a point where, um, as far as the opposition, 